I'm joined today by Ernest Hernandez. Ernest, please introduce yourself. Hi, I am Ernest Hernandez, and I am the Director of Video Technology in the Division of Academic Innovation at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And you have experience in digital media production that many don't. Can you share a little bit about that? The great thing about working at UTSA right now is that our department within academic innovation, we are, it's kind of our mission to uh, try things out. It, it's kind of, it's part of the mission to, to do pilots of programs. It's part of our mission to think differently about how we create media, uh, what really to make it pers you know, purposeful that what we're doing. And if you're, you're going to try to communicate to a larger audience, thinking of dynamic ways to engage them and to help move them to the point where you're hoping to move them, whether it's a pro promotional video that has a call to action or whether it's an informational video um, for some you know important information that may affect, uh, say, your health, mental health, things of that nature. It's also very exciting that we are able to engage with a lot of students. Um, we're working more with uh, digital comm students and film and media studies students. Um, in my department, I, I've had them crew for our video production team a couple of times. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to be here right now. And right as you know, I think a large part of it was the media, media, multimedia profession, whatever slice of it you're working in, content creator, producer, editor, it really came to be quite an important skill set demonstrated during, during, during the pandemic. And now um, we see that folks that have that experience, skill set, uh, creative urge, are they're, they're at a premium. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's hard to keep your better multimedia professionals because every company, every institution is looking for them because they really recognize the power of the message with, with video or with um, a well-constructed piece of audio, like in the case of a podcast. What lights you up about working in digital media? What are, what are the pieces that, that really get you fired up? I mean, I enjoy the creative aspect of it. I, I enjoy like you, you get a project and you're, you have to sit down and you have to figure things out, right? You've got to come up with a way to, um, you know, it, to execute a production. So you've got your pre-production and you've got all the analytical, logical um, things that go along with that. Uh, or I should say logistics along with that, but it really gets down to coming up with a hook, right? Coming up with a creative riff. And, and Ryan, I also play music. I, I love music. That always excites me. So there are times that I think about a video project the same way I would think about constructing the song. Um, and it's, it's about the riff. You know, it's about that memorable riff that makes you go, oh, yeah, I love that song. Um, so you think about it in video or, or media production, we had a project um, training. It's a, it's a training video to show a UTSA audience how to use a new feature in Office 365. So when I met with the, uh, the client for this project, I had mentioned, look, we really need some sort of hook here. We need something to happen at the beginning and then we can come back to it at the end. It's like a gag, it's like a joke, right? And so he thought about it and he came back with this. It is, he wanted to start the video where he's on a team's meeting with his crew and we pick him up in, you know, mid sentence saying, and that's why I think a hot dog is a sandwich. And so that was our gag right there. Okay. That's a cool line, but now you've got to set it up. You know, you've got to bring the concept of the hot dog in early and then need to revisit it at the end. So the last shot for this was a tracking shot where uh, the talent walks out of their office to the middle of this, this particular room, and there on the table is a stack of hot dogs. And they pick one up, and you know they do the tagline, and they're gonna take a bite of the hot dog, right? So we brought it, wrapped it all together. Along the way, things happen that you, know, you didn't factor in, which make it even funnier when you know the backstory. Um, 
But it's stuff like that that I really get excited about. Coming up with something creative as a solution to, um, you know, how are you going to make this training video even somewhat interesting? You know, and, and, and humor is hard to do, Ryan. I found out this semester, too, in teaching for the first time, none of our students approached humor or a comedy or the film they were even going to create. And it's because that's the hardest thing to do uh, is to communicate comedy or humor, um, especially in a narrative form. So that's always fun to try to come up with a gag that doesn't, you know, the funniest things usually offend somebody. So you have to be careful in that, that aspect of it as well. I think that's probably why they weren't choosing <laughs> for like not going to choose comedy as one of their first big projects because it's fraught with so much risk. Yeah, it's hard to do. How do you help to mitigate the risk in these kinds of projects? Because on one hand, you might have a training project that you're trying to spice up. You're trying to make it interesting. On the other hand, you might have a more creative project where if you push too far, that risk could backfire. Well, yes, and that's happened to us in the past at UTSA. When I worked in com commercially before UTSA, it wasn't a really an issue, right? That that big of an issue. About at UTSA, we were we were producing a series um, a while back where the CIO of information technology wanted to do a series to introduce the UTSA audience to different products and services that information technology offered. A product was rolling out that would allow students to to know how close they were to graduating, right, and what classes they still needed to take. And so we did this thing. Um, the gag was uh, we set up um, a student as a fortune teller. And we used a classroom. We got it lit just perfect. We had position perfect. She had the right costume, the right attire. And she had this crystal ball that we had lit up right there and other bobbles and bangles and stuff happening. There was a line of students waiting outside the classroom to come meet with the fortune teller. It it went beautifully. I mean, it was it was funny in a natural way because the students, you know, were were really getting in with it with a gag. And so we sent it up. We thought, okay, this is going to be great. Maybe we can submit it for an award or something. Well, we didn't mean to, and I still apologize for this. Um, sometimes it's hard to have that 360 view, but, uh, the advisors didn't appreciate the video. You know, what was happening is that the, the fortune teller was looking into her crystal ball, but she was actually looking off to the side at the application that tells you what classes you still need to take. So that was, uh, the gag part, right? So she was looking into the future and these are the courses you still needed. It seemed, you know, cute and funny. But it, it didn't acknowledge what a great job our advisors do and, and what, they, what they go through in trying to help a student through a journey. So we pulled it. And it never, it never aired. It's still on my demo reel, but, you know, it's not, you know, UTSA it's not going to see it. So, and there was um, a profile we did of an online student. Uh, for online programs that's a big football fan. Her and her husband have season tickets to go to every home game. Their daughter's part of it, the family tailgates. A lot of great stuff. We shot the tailgate. You know, at any tailgate, there's going to be a lot of come and take it flags because UTSA was using that, um, maybe not officially, but unofficially it was, it was part of the, the fan uh, experience. So we had to shoot very carefully to avoid that. But then we discovered, like, a two-second shot of B-roll. The the husband of the student is, you know, doing the thing on the grill, got his apron, turns around, got the come and take it logo on the apron, on the orange apron. So, again, to avoid any type of blowback from anywhere in, in a situation like this, Ryan, you do not want to put the leadership in a position to be embarrassed by anything. So you got to act quick. you got to pull it down. Come up with a solution to how to fix it, you know, without, you know, having to rebuild everything. And, um, you know, we won. Navigating the needs of stakeholders sounds like a big challenge. What are some of the other challenges that come to mind? Because having to navigate upsetting someone who feels they're being made fun of or upsetting an audience member who might take it up 
to the, say I'm pulling my donation or something like that. How do you navigate these challenges and what are some of the other challenges that you've faced? Well, I, I have found that it's very effective to listen, to truly listen to what, what the issue may be. If you have an argument or a position that you believe in, and it's, it's appropriate to push back. But at, at the end of the day, you know, you have to respect who the client is or who the audience is. If you want your own platform to uh, express your views, you, you're more than welcome to do that. You can become a content creator and say what you like, how you would like to say it. But if you're working for a client, then there is a trust there that has to be established. And I believe that it's it's uh, the same in at at an institution as it would be in the commercial world. You need to listen. I have found that don't get upset, don't take things personally. You'll have your opportunity to be creative and expressive. This may not be the one. So let's go ahead and 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 complete the project professionally and maintain that trust with the client. And as creatives, we might be working with clients who ha have a change of scope and their change orders might be more than we expected. And even if we have a great contract and we have a great operating procedure, that can be a real challenge. Do you have any controversial perspectives with working with clients on creative projects? Is there anything that comes to mind when you hear the word controversy? As creatives, you know, I, I, I work with clients, I'm not calling them clients, but it could be faculty, it could be leadership, it could be uh, someone from the outside. Like recently, um, I, was a, I was a client because I hired a person to do professional voiceovers for our online programs uh, marketing. And I, I also, you know, produce music and I, there's a studio I work with. What happens, Ryan, is that as an editor, and there's times that you see a certain client, client coming in and you're like, oh, man, we're going to have fun today. We always have fun. We always have a good time. And then you see that client walk, and you're like, God, 500 revisions. They don't know really what they want. They don't won't know what they want until they see it. And that'll be like four hours later. The point of view I'm, I'm having is that's, that's, at least what I can think of right now, controversy that you see is having to prepare yourself for a client that might be less than professional. What can we do to accelerate the process of helping them to get to where they want? Are there certain kinds of questions that you might listen to those answers a little bit more intently? Yeah, you know, there, there's a range depending on, on where you're at, uh, the, the weight, the value of the, the, the potential video, especially when it comes to things that fall more on the training side. You know, I'll ask the question is why, why would a video be better than a PowerPoint? What, what, is, what is it that you want the video to do for you? The, the logical answer is, well, we, we want it to have a human touch to it. Okay. Well, are we, you know, what's the script looking like? There again, it's like, it's very dry. It's uh, training. And then we go back to the whole situation of explaining to the human condition of needing to have engagement with a video. I mean, there's, I read years ago that people's brains basically shut off after six seconds if something doesn't happen on the screen. Right. And that's what hurts a lot of that, that type of content. The other side of it is working with a client to know who their audience is, how the audience is going to see this. Is it on YouTube? Is it, um, is it embedded onto a website? Well, what's the delivery for the deliverable? And then what's the assessment going to be like? How are you going to know that the video was successful or what you needed? How will we know? that we hit the mark. And then they go and start thinking about these things. And then the, the, the concept gets a little bit tempered. And once we can get them to focus on, I, I try Brian really hard to get our clients to focus on a single message. Just what's the one thing you want the audience to know after they see this video. And the tendency is that, um, there's some, departments that when they do a video, they, they feel like it's going to be their only chance to do a video. So there's a lot of information they want to include in the video. I recommend 
the other way. So look, you, you don't have to do just one video. It's, it's probably better that you do several videos, make them topical, even episodic if you want to, and just focus on delivering a single message with that one video. Before, when I worked in the commercial realm side of things, the uh, concept of branding was really starting to, to evolve. It's always been there, right? But it's just called, was called something else before. And now we're, we're, we're into branding. And so we produced a lot of lifestyle spots. All they did was get the name out, get the brand out. Really didn't tell you what it did. Didn't tell you what it's for. Didn't tell you how to get it. All it wanted to do was for you to attach this brand to these really cool lifestyle experiences. And that's it. They're real effective. And then the next time you do one, you know, you, it's about what the product actually is. Oh, it's a beer. I knew that. And then, you know, you go on from there. What are the metrics? What are the most important metrics that you use to define whether a media artifact or a piece has really met its mark, has been successful? Because I know I'm looking at retention a lot as my one of my number one indicators. And whenever I see retention take a nosedive, I have to reevaluate what I did do or didn't do to maintain that attention. What are some of those other metrics that we use to evaluate success? Well, I, I think I need to start with, with the actual production of the, or the, or the concept of the video piece. Uh, again, a piece I read years ago, you and I, Ryan, were brought up to watch television differently than what our multimedia audience watches video now. We are uh, trained, we were oriented in the great reveal. And that's where you're watching a show and they're forward promoting during a break, this great thing that's gonna happen, right? This blockbuster thing that's gonna happen. And uh, we hang with it for three segments until yeah. we get to the fourth segment and then the joke, the surprise, the laughter, it's, it's revealed to us, right? News program, sports program, all kind of the same here now with the way that our audience receives this message you have to front load your video you have to have your best stuff in the first seven seconds your best b-roll your funniest line anything like that yelling the name of the product from the top of a mountain has to happen in the first seven seconds so i feel like Retention, yeah, that that's ultimately very important because there's a call to action that needs to happen within that 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 piece. Uh, an example for us. Oh, okay. So to finish that thought of it, if I've got a thirty second video and I've had somebody stay on past seven seconds, I feel pretty good about it because I I feel that they were hung on long enough to get the most important part of that message. The other 23 seconds, just basically back it up, give you different examples of how it uh, has played out, you know, whatever that, that particular thing is that we're promoting. And then there'll be a call to action there as well, uh, which makes you wish they would have stayed for the full 30 to get that. Okay, now we're producing promotional ma marketing material video for our online programs uh, unit, division, department. And they have a marketing partner we're able to get really good analytics on things that we're releasing. Now, here is the situation. The messages are designed, the video is designed to get the student, or potential prospective student to the website and to click something. Once they click something, then they'll be engaged by professionals from enrollment to help them learn more information. So we're finding that it's... Um, We've got a good sense of our, our videos being successful from this type of engagement. I understand it. I, I don't understand it. It's a digital marketing realm that is uh, increasingly becoming an important skill set for content creators to have. As such, my newest hire is a multimedia professional, but also is, is well versed in digital marketing. So that's going to be a tremendous for us because I'll, I'll get to add that aspect to our production process. It's no longer just pre-production, production, post-production. 
it, it's a whole different world. It's, it's the, then that process is now it's pre-production and then there's now we've got actually stuff before pre-production. We've got meetings during the pandemic. I learned that it was effective when setting up potential interviews that you do pre-interviews first on zoom, just to get to know the personality of the person. Uh, so you know where to, to, to approach the interview. So that before it, now we go into pre-production, the logistics of planning, the production, and then we go to the post-production where we're sweetening the audio and adding graphics and doing anything that we need to do. And then we go into review and then we go into revision and you just better plan for them. You're not going to get it right the first time. Even if you think you did, someone's going to have something that they're going to want to have tweaked. Review, revision, and then you go into access, accessibility, making sure that there's captioning on the video. And then you go into assessment. You need to get some real good feedback analytics on, on the success of that video. They, they need to be objective. They need to be anonymous. You know, putting, sending someone a survey in the email is not going to get you really any good information. So that's what I know about that. So at each step of the process, the pre-planning for the pre-interview, the pre-planning for the production, the actual execution of the production, the actual evaluation of the production. At each step of this process, is there a metric you have in your head that is the most important? Let's see these qualify as metrics. You know, when you first meet with a client, like in this case, you know, I've talked about online programs and we had a great meeting with a team. We formed a team that was across departments. We did basically ask the questions that I had shared with you earlier. Who's the audience? Um, who's, what's the demographic? And it um, goes heavily towards Hispanic women, uh, 26 plus. All right, cool. That's good to know. How are you going to reach them? We're going to reach them via social media. We're going to need vertical video as well as horizontal video. We're going to need seven seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and a under two minute profile. All right, so now I've got my list of deliverables, and that's an important thing to establish because that deliverable list will grow, shrink, rearrange as, as things become hot, brand new programs going up. We got to get a video of that now. So scooch that one in there, move this one down and let's prep, prep for it. When we get into the pre-interview, th this qualifies as metrics where we're looking for certain things. We're looking for a dynamic personality. We're looking for what is different about this particular student. student. Uh, we're just not going to call them non-traditional uh, because that doesn't tell you anything. Are you a stay-at-home mom? Are you a executive who is trying to advance their career? Are you a military vet? You know, are you a young student that just doesn't feel comfortable in a at a large university? What are the, what's the uniqueness about this person? And then once we get into the pre-production, the metrics there are, are checklists, especially we go on the road. We've shot an interview in, in Houston late last year. And, you know, there you just can't run back to the studio, grab that cable you forgot. You know, you've got to work with your production assistant to go through and make sure you have everything, that you have batteries charged, so that you have electrical if you need it because of the battery failure, et cetera, et cetera. Did you bring SD cards? Do we have enough? Did, do we have gaff tape? Um, gaff tape is specialized tape for production. It holds things down, but it's not sticky and it's super expensive. So it's, it's, it's like gold, you know, it's production gold at gaff tape. And then in production, pre-production going into production, we typically come away from an interview with about hour, hours worth of content. Uh, I use a media management system to upload the content and myself and my colleague who works in, um, academic strategic communications. We go through and uh, we put together a long cut of the, the interview, probably about 12 minutes. And then from there, we start shaping it into what will finally be a two minute uh, piece of video. So the metric there is, is reduction, reduction on that, you know, bringing it down to a refinement and then you know, the proper B-roll to, to, to help tell that side of the story. B-roll is an art in and of itself. If it's done well, it's like a concentric story. It's its own, you know, if you can look at the B-roll and not listen to the audio and it would still tell you something, you know, and then you've done a good job. You're doing photojournalism at that point. In post-production, 
it's about the same as production as far as like going through the fine comb, making sure the proper place things are in place. Is the voice very clear? That's the most important part of it. Can we hear the talent? The balance between the music and the talent is very important. I do some advanced skills working with limiters and EQs to try to help that along. And then we, we go to the lengthier review and revision part. That's when leadership sees it and they're checking their own boxes. You know, you're looking at a team of myself as the director. Uh, we've got our communications person and then we've got our marketing person. And they're, each of them are checking off different boxes, right? I'm looking at my own monitor while the interview or conversation is happening, thinking to myself, is this going to cut well together? What do we need here? What do we need there? So I, I didn't give you any real metrics as to percentages or um, things that we can put on a bar graph, but there still is uh, a process that uh, pretty much looks like a checklist at the end of the day that's on a timeline that has certain, uh, we could use those points of, of the different parts of the process and put a number to the percentage of engagement that it takes. Um, and that'll be interesting because it's going to vary from client to client. Yeah. This client might be high on this metric and that the next client might be low on the exact same metrics. You, you probably have a personal North star though. Like for example, I always want to design with the audience in mind first, because I think that serves the client best. Uh, and, and if we could boil it down to some simple things like that, which, what would you pick? The, the first thing that I, that I look for, whether I'm reviewing my own work or the work of my staff is we're always talking about length and, you know, trying to get that video down to the essential of it. And one thing I found that works for me, if I watch a video and it feels like it was 90 seconds but it's actually two minutes in length, then I think it's good. If I watch a video that's a minute, but it feels like five, then it needs work. And in, in what, I, in what I do mostly Ryan, for UTSA is I'm editing content. We do a lot of interviews, a lot of profiles, a lot of storytelling. You're, you're looking at, I mean, you can look at it like you would a screenplay, or you can look at it like a book, or you can look at it different ways. You can use the narrative arc to help guide the story. You can use three acts if you want, but then it kind of goes counter to what I said earlier. You got your first seven seconds are the most vital to, to get somebody hooked in. And, and then from there, you know, you got to match the energy from what that seven seconds did for you. And once you do that, and you have something that's lively and dynamic, it should feel shorter than it is. And if that's the case, then I think it's it's a well-crafted piece of work. You mentioned storytelling and and how you feel when you see a piece being one of the most important things that guide you as to whether that piece is meeting its goals or not. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between storytelling and managing those kinds of indicators that make you feel like a piece works? Yeah, I, I think you pick up a lot of that in the pre-interview um, with a, a perspective, talent, or story. You know, any good story has an important element to it that makes it worth listening to. It's It's been said in different ways. It's the climax in a narrative arc. But what happens is there's transformation. Your protagonist, your hero, your mom, the story is about something happened. There was a struggle, and then there was transformation, and then you feel good. We structured the the profile we did on our, our football mom for online programs to show her struggle. You know, we, we had a piece in there where she just confesses, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for college. When I got out of high school, I, I went to college and I just wasn't ready. I was a terrible student. I mean, my grades showed it. And now, or later in life, she has a daughter. So it's important for her to prove to her daughter that her daughter can do anything. And so she's going back to school for her family. She's going back to school to prove something to her daughter. This has a lot of layers to it, Ryan. This is one woman telling a young woman, you can do 
anything, right? This is transformative in that sense. She now has assumed the role of being a tree with her daughter being the apple, as opposed to where she thought of herself before as the apple that was just a bad apple when it came to going to college. That's never said. That's never, you know, like up on a cue card, but that's the feel for the story. It, that transformation occurs. We're still within the persuasive arts. We're still persuading the call to action is, okay, you can do it too, mom. You can go back to school and get your degree and, and plan what you want your profession to be, be now. Absolutely, yes. The, the skill of managing stakes in storytelling. What are some other skills that come to mind that are really important in this digital communication line of work? Uh, experimentation. Uh, you've, you've got to try out different things and leadership's important too. And what I mean by that is you need to set up a structure within, uh, whatever it is, the context is that you're working in an environment, whether you have a boss or not, you have to set yourself up for second iteration design. You, you launch a pilot, you try something that pilot could be a number of different things within digital media website to video, several different things. As you plan, then you're planning for the assessment phase where you see what works, what didn't work, and then you go into your second iteration on what it is you're creating and you know hope to build something better. You don't want the anxiety of being expected to hit it out of the park the first time. The way I look at it, Ryan, I don't know if you're much of a baseball fan, but in this creative profession, I feel like if you're batting 300, you're doing pretty good. So what does that tell you? That tells you seven times you're going to strike out at the plate and three times you're going to engage the ball. And I, I think that you have to have the willingness to, to look at your wins and losses like that. I, I've produced stuff that has stunk, right? And it may be a couple of reasons. Maybe I didn't enjoy working with the client. Maybe I got bored. Maybe I was distracted. If you don't learn from them, they're, they're, I had one recently where I just blew a call that I should know better about. And that created us having to have a reshoot because I just got things. I didn't follow my own advice on how to do this. And it, it had come down simply to trying to shoot an interview outside in the middle of the day. Just not going to work. The, 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 the sun will kill you unless you have the proper materials to help, you know, work that, that scene out. When we talk about the value of failure and the value of the iterative process without getting burned out and paying attention to these kinds of metrics to help us iterate better the next time, what are some of the, the keys that we need to have in mind? Do we, do we have a framework or something that might help us to fail less often as we create? Um, Yes. And the, the first thing is positivity. Um, we're calling it failure right now because we don't have a better word for it. There's probably some ancient word in a very wise culture that reframes failure into just being a step of the process and not the end of the process. So that's the most important thing to think of. And that's why Ryan, we were discussing second iteration design because that shows you there's an afterlife to this project. So, Yes, the framework that you need to follow, I, I think you can create it your own way. You can connect the boxcars to this train however you like, but it's really about, you know, pre-production, production, post-production post in the middle. But then if you can break down your pre-production, what does that mean to you? And what are the steps that you need to take to do it? And in certain circumstances, pre-interview. All right, could be a, one of those steps, one of those frameworks. But I have my boxcar set up a certain way for certain projects. You got to open up that box and put the applicable steps in there for you. If you're a forgetful person, then you need to create in the production box a checklist that lists every single piece of gear you need to take, right, in that particular case. If you're in the pre-production part and you're scripting, you need to really understand what the primary message in that script is supposed to be and cut out things that don't really work in that. 
If you're in post-production and you're editing, you might find you have a shot. Beautiful, most beautiful shot piece of B-roll that was done for the whole project. But the content you would match that with has been cut out of the program. So now you have to be brave enough to just drop it, let it go. It's not going to work. It might be beautiful as it stands, but it brings no value to the video at that particular point. So that's, that's, that's part of the framework that you set up for yourself. You discovery phase, then you go back to your framework and you figured out where the failure occurred. What you'll find many times is that you had multiple points of failure. You had the potential for multiple points of failure. At that time, then you eliminate some of those points, right? This created, this created too much I spent too much time trying to light this a certain way that I ran out of time for actually shooting and directing the talent on what needed to be done, right? So then time management is part of that assessment. So what, how long do you have with the talent? And in our particular case, Ryan, because we work for an institution, many times there's not money involved. And, and m- money is, is a good controller. Money is a good time management manager for you Uh, because you can't waste it when there's dollar signs involved. In our particular case, the valuable concept for a lot of the folks that we work with is their time. So now that's the currency, and that's what you have to manage even better. So you'll find that might be a point of failure. You'll find that maybe you spent too much time planning and designing and didn't allow yourself enough time to actually make the edit or post-production or get the, the piece to where you wanted it to be. And then the worst part is, if you didn't allow time for revision and review, you're, you're hurting sh- yourself along the way. That's a very basic, simplistic way of looking at it, but it sure does help me a lot. Time, money, these are really important to manage in the production process. What are some other big ideas like that that you have to keep a constant eye on as you're working through the process of creating a piece? Ego. <clears throat> That's, that's something, you know, again, you, to be successful, I do believe you need to adopt, learn, nurture a certain sense of diplomacy. Even if you know you're the smartest person in the room or most experienced person in the room, it goes back to listening and being able to, to work egos together. And what I, what I re, what I want to clarify on that, I don't mean Ryan, that a person who walks in <clears throat> And they're wearing a, you know, they're wearing a beret and then they want a folding chair with their name on the back of it because they've just arrived on set and, you know, they're all that. But people have egos and don't realize it, right? And it has to do with their, could be with their position, their station, you know, it could be uh, their experience because they're a subject matter expert, be it SME. There is often too many cooks in the kitchen, especially when it comes to the review or revision part. And you need to, to approach this, or you should approach this with understanding every comment has value. Now, because it is a piece of currency, it may not be the right money for this project. You know, so you keep that in mind too. You should be aware intuitively of where the egos are, what they're about, and manage that diplomatically, best you can. I think time, money, and ego are great North Stars, great things to put on the top of the list as you work through whatever process, whether it's a podcast or a video or whatever it is that you're working to produce. I think that those are those are really good things to keep at the top of our lists for sure. Thank you for sharing those. Do you have a success story that might bring this idea into focus? I do. And it may not be your typical success story, but I felt very good, very accomplished after this particular production that that I'll talk about. At the core of it is collaboration. And when you win, the team wins. When the team wins, you win. For many years, our, our department worked... Uh, as producer directors and pretty much individually. So 
the, the gig would be I would assign you a client and you'd go work with them. We had very few projects that were big enough for a team effort, or as one of my staff like to say, all hands on deck. But in looking to innovate and be more creative with videos that we're producing for our clients, in this case, again, it's online programs, we were to establish a team that was uh, inter interdepartmental and everyone had a specialty. I had uh, a new multimedia specialist working with us who had a fantastic plans. We traveled to Houston to do a profile on a young lady that was our first uh, master's degree in a program that had been launched, you know, a year before that. And we're in Houston and, and we're going to shoot at her job, stand up interview plus B roll. And we're shooting at her house. Same thing, more stand up uh, interview and B roll. And we go to the park and we go to different places outdoor where we want to, to show her, her that aspect, those facets of her, who she is as a person, not just as a student and professional. And when we were on set, we, uh, we just assumed our roles, Ryan. I mean, it was like a well-oiled team at that point. We had done, up to that point, we're in production. All those tipped all those steps before, we had executed them. We learned a lot from them. Discovery happened. And now we're ready for this two-day shoot in Houston. Okay. We come back. Go through the, the post-production process, make the edits, different deliverables that were needed uh, for social media again, finished the video, went through review. At, at that point, the team is, we do have a lot of our own internal review and revision, and it's great because I'll submit a cut of the video using one of our review tools like Frame.io, and then my two other partners who is communications and marketing They'll make their comments on there. I'll send it back to our videographer editor also, and it just flows. And there's not a bad thought. There's not a bad idea. It proved egoless for everybody on the team. The, the amount of respect, the ability to listen, it was a success because we all had the same eye for the prize. And I felt after the experience and with how well the video is doing, uh, it has done, was very successful for the client, very successful for our talent. Um, she continues to, to just grow and to, to, to move on and be promoted. I felt it, it, it was successful to me because it, it gave me, to go back to the concept of framework, it gave me the framework for how we go forward in producing these pieces. For the first time, I lived the word collaboration. I've heard it, I've said it, we've attempted it, we pretend to do it all over the place, but honestly, this was true collaboration that led to success. Here's the other part of it, Ryan, that I mentioned before, first semester teaching in film and media studies, digital video production, you know, those are group projects. Each group's gonna make a film. That experience in getting that egoless collaboration to occur informed me of how to get students to not, that's different for comm and film students, but you know, generally speaking, students don't like group projects. It could be for a number of different reasons. But I felt being able to share with them my team approach and get them to kind of fall into not identifying who the slacker is going to be and identifying the person that's going to do everything, but really getting things balanced out and listening to each other. To me, it's a big success. And it, it's not, it's not, you can't see it. It's not a, a trophy or a plaque on the wall or more dollar signs, more zeros on my check. But professionally, it, it was huge success. I, I love that story. How did you get there? <laughs> Right, because because I imagine that you you have lots and lots of things that you could talk about for how to get there. But if you could boil it down to maybe some sources of wisdom that you've gone to over and over again, are there some creators that maybe inspire you and in the, their processes? Are there there are some systems that you've adopted that you feel helped you to get to play at that higher level of media production? I do know this. I am I am um, a different person than I was 10 years ago in this respect. I felt 
you know, in a competitive nature, you want to own everything, right? So you want to be the best editor. You want to be the best shooter. You think you're the best director of the group. You think these other things because I have all this other commercial experience behind me that you want to, you want to try to own everything. And probably the success of the team, and I could be completely wrong about this, but I'm going to take a stab at it. Of the team, of the four members on the team that have executed that project I talked about and other projects for online programs, I'm the senior member, right? So I had a full director title working with two assistant directors and multimedia specialists. So it would be very easy for a person like myself to bully the situation, right? And to talk about their years of experience and et cetera, et cetera, even not consciously, just even subconsciously, people can vibe like that. You probably run into them all the time. People vibe you a certain way that they want you to know something about. They want you to know who they are without having to say it, right? They drop names, they drop stuff. They're they're vibing you to you know try to put you in a certain place. And you can you can't do that you know, to have a successful team in collaboration. As as a matter of fact. I enjoyed listening to the ideas and the suggestions of people that were my junior, either in age or in profession, and learning from that experience. And I think if your leader can make it a point to to have those qualities and to display those qualities, they're going to be returned. They're going to be reciprocated throughout the team. You won't be seen as a weak leader. You won't be seen as someone who's past their prime. You'll be seen as someone that is truly interested in the success of the team and the project. And that's when collaboration happens. Because what does that mean, Brian? They they trust you because you trust them. It's wonderful to hear the importance of teamwork and collaboration and group work and leadership. Since our discipline teaches those things, we're, we don't just teach digital media or digital communication, right? We're teaching those those core skills too. I I really appreciate the nuance with which you described how these kinds of factors like ego or skill level can help to produce or get in the way of a production. Because I can imagine that, that those sorts of things can get in the way or they can elevate a production. What are some sources that you would recommend people who are in digital media go to to help level up their skill sets? That is a very good question because there is a lot available. There, There is a lot out there. I regularly receive an email that's um, one of those uh, platforms that aggregates a lot of stuff from around the web. It's called No Film School. And I like it because just the title itself is interesting right? Provocative. No film school, right? Not for me. Uh, that gives you a sense of indie, you know, independent, do-it-yourself type person. Uh, we all know YouTube videos can be very effective for skills. I am looking into right now uh, enrolling in a master class for a uh, new piece of equipment that is very high-end. So for the sole purpose of being able to train others on how to use it. There's not really one particular source, but I'll tell you, you know, once you find a podcast or you find a platform that you really like, then that's the best resource for you. There's some folks out there that are very analytical and they need to learn uh, step one, step two, step three, step four. There's others that are very conceptual or I, I guess we could call it that. And they need to be, they need to be excited. They need to be uh, drawn in by concepts. And then from the concepts, we learn the tools that we need to, 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 to work with that. And those of us who learn best by trial by fire. <laughs> oh, that's important. Yeah, that, that's really important. I'm really into, for, for the video side right now, I am just intrigued with color correction and color grading because we have the cameras now and the capability where it's important to be able to match color, match scenes. And it's such an art just in and of itself. And it's the type of art that um, you cannot trust your eyes. You have to use your instruments. You know, it's like flying a plane. 
you know, sure, you can have the windows look out in the sky, but you've got to follow your instruments to know where you are. And it's, it's, it's like uh, when I've done sound mixing, you have to walk away. You have to rest your eyes. You still need to use them, but just don't trust them and then rest them. It's got me. You know, I, I want to re be really good at color grading and color correction. So I'm looking for sources for that. And now I've, you know, found a couple of things that, you know, I might pursue just to have that skill set. Is there something in this industry that you think people should be paying more attention to? Yes, I do. I, I think more attention to social media videos because they are going to revolutionize. Once a link is found, you know, because we're experimenting with longer form stuff on social media, we're experimenting with shorter form. I think we've, you know, had our, our taste of what seven seconds is like. I get a feed that I watch for a little bit in the evening of a lot of our influencer types. And I'm amazed at their production skills. I'm amazed at what they're able to do in a minimalist form and fashion, especially when working with animals. That this may be a 20 second or 14 second video, but it has a beginning, middle, and an end to it. It's just brilliant, you know. And and you're thinking, ah, oh, they're just being silly out there with their dogs. No, no, it's well constructed. And when you've seen a couple of behind the scenes of what they do. They're uh, you're fabricating footage, and they're put it in the can, and they pull it out when they need it, you know, for the story, what the story needs. And I think it's just a really different way of looking at how you go about uh, telling the story uh, using film, digital media, video, whatever you, you want to call it. And I think it's going to influence a lot. I think it will influence, certainly it's influenced, you know, uh, commercials and that side of the industry. But even how, you know, we're all concerned about how we consume information, this will have a big effect on that if it already hasn't already had that. The other thing I think you should pay attention to on the other side is support those podcasts and support those documentaries that are coming out that are longer form, have truth to them, have thoughts to them that should be unbiased, or the podcast that is simply a conversation like we're having today, Ryan, where you feel like you're talking to a trusted friend or a relative and you're learning something about what, um, you, hopefully something resonates with you. And that's, that's what you want. You, you want a sense of community. The seven second, 14 second video creates one type of community, but podcasts and documentaries create a completely different type of community that's still very important. That's going to be the thing. And they're trending high right now and have been for the past couple of years, documentaries and podcasts. But that's what's going to keep us sane from the overload of uh, stimulation, emotion, visuals on the 14-second site. That's my opinion. I appreciate that because I think that I learn different skill sets and I nurture different skill sets based on those different formats. Because if I'm creating a short and I'm editing, 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 it's very different from I'm looking for the meaning. I'm looking for that meaningful, the the depth, the the, the complete story as opposed to the mini story. The, these are very different skill sets in the mind for anyone working with media or anyone working to produce or be and call themselves a creator. What advice do you have for our students who are about to graduate as digital communication majors? Advice for our graduates crossing the stage. They've done it, and now they're going to go out into the big, bad world and secure that job that's going to start their professional career that they'll love for the rest of their life. Well, uh, the, the first thing, as you are positioning yourself to apply for positions, don't limit yourself to the type of position you're looking for. If, in fact, you have your degree and you're well, well skilled in, in that aspect of communication. I'm going to focus on digital comm because that's what I know a little bit more of. You've got to be, you got to be willing to, to try to, to spin it a couple of different ways, uh, depending on what you're, you're doing. Um, I'll give you an example. I have uh, my recent hire, the current job they have is as a uh, manager of digital marketing. But I'm hiring them as a content creator, storyteller, videographer, editor type. 
and they have that in in their skill set. I mean, in their portfolio, but they also have this other aspect. So they're able to apply for a job, tailor their portfolio a little bit for that particular job. Think in terms of how what was now what was before a solid position and who, the title was never going to change. That new concepts in jobs are popping up every day and if you can be the type of thinker where you can identify now i'm already doing this wearing this hat and i'm asked to wear this hat if i could put those two hats together create a new position with a dynamic title to it then i'm creating you are in effect creating your own upward projection right you're you're and it's it's really important you may find there isn't a pathway available to you in certain jobs. It, it's to my experience that the jobs that do have a pathway tend to be the less exciting jobs possibly uh, because continuity is important in that particular profession. Brand could be standard and not really look for innovation. But if you can... Think about innovation, not only within the job you may get, but in how the whole function of the office department, whatever works. That's the advice I, I give is to look to create something, look to create something outside of what the scope of that particular job may be or holds for you. And you'll find, I believe, more opportunities will open up for yourself. I love that. So this idea of wearing more than one hat and creating a path instead of just following the path that's been set before us for that particular career. Let me just follow up with that just and just to clarify, it's it's a lot of people are going to bitch about giving extra work without extra pay. You know, and we all know the the saying the more you do, the more you do. And then we get pissed at the person that just shows up, slacks for eight hours and makes the same amount of money you do. Okay, that's life, right? That's the jungle. That's how it goes. So you got you got to flip that, and you have to say, okay, well, I've got to do this job and this job, and they won't pay me for it. Hey, no one wants a new title without the pay, but you know what? If you create those two those two experiences and you create a title that's dynamic, now you put yourself in the position to shop for another job for better pay. I think that's really important. I I have a grad assistant that. She took on being our media management uh, person, and I promoted to her from the very beginning. I said, this is a skill set that is really in demand, and you're killing it. You're understanding metadata and how to work this, this system, organize in it, metadata it. It's, you need to put this in your portfolio. You need to put this on your resume. It's really going to be important because after you leave, the next person I'm looking to bring in, I'm going to be looking for that. You know, what do you know about metadata and media management? That sort of thing. So I, I tell that to my staff. They're like, okay, what's what's the next step, boss? You know, where do I go from here? And it's like, where do you want to go? Let's talk about that. And then let's talk about how we get there. You know, creating a, creating a new path. Are you doing something with this new position that's helping two different departments within your unit? You know, that that's 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 it, dude. I mean, it's that's collaborative, that's innovative. And that's creation. Fantastic. What is the most important skill that people need to start developing today for a job that's related to media production? Awareness. Uh, to do your homework and shop around or to, to understand what the demand is for your skill set now. It's probably never been higher than where it's at right now. You know, I hear stories, I read bylines, I see stuff where people are not businesses, corporations, institutions, they're not hiring engineers, they're hiring communicators. They're finding that that skill set is most important. So be a good, clear communicator, right? Part of that is being an effective listener. You you have the chops. You you took the classes, you passed the exams, you have the chops, you have the 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 muscle memory, right, to, for lack of a better phrase, and again, I'm going all sports analogies on you, but 
you've already got that muscle memory. So you're ready to, to go back up to the plate. You just need to communicate what that's like. You need to be able to listen first to your manager, your coach, you know, your leader, whatever the case would be, and express, you know, how your skill set plays into that. It may not play within the scope of how the job description is written, but it may address the core issue at play. And to be able to communicate that is very important. I, you know, I, I don't normally do this, but I believe this is what I do really well. And I think that'll take care of what's happening with this issue. So adaptation, awareness, listening, these communication skills, they can really help you to sit and get that job that is ultimately rewarding into the one that you want. Yeah. Give it time. And always, you know, give it time. Enjoy the journey along the way. Don't get frustrated. You know, I write it go that, man, I went to school for four years. Actually, it took me six years. I got all this debt and stuff. And, you know, got all my other siblings are doctors and lawyers and et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're putting unnecessary pressure on you. You have to enjoy the journey. It's, 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 this is, you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life, working, really. Just retirement might not be an option. So, I mean, you've got to think of yourself, you know, back before there was civilization, you were out hunting for food and that's, you're just still doing the same thing now. Uh, so just enjoy the kills, right? When you get them and save yourself a little meat and make yourself a nice fur jacket and you'll be okay. If you could leave one idea in the mind of our audience, what do you think is the most important key takeaway? Uh, positivity and forward momentum. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, in spending this time with you, Ryan, it's very evident to me that you are reaching out and communicating to the audience of how to move ahead, how to move forward. And you're looking for concepts and stories, uh, anecdotes that take things in a positive, that are able to balance what can happen to you, what might happen to you that might not be very you know, might be kind of not cool. Um, and really how to bring that back into a lens that moves forward with a positive headlight on it. And I, I appreciate that. I, I think that's, that's, that's excellent. Um, that is what I'm taking away from this experience. So what are employers, what are clients looking for when they're looking to hire a digital media professional? How would they, how should they write that LinkedIn profile? What I have found over the past several years that everybody is looking for is a storyteller. And what I've seen on resumes and cover letters that come to me from potential hires, they are talking about their ability to tell a story. Everybody wants a story. And I, I think this is going to hit kind of hit back on the podcast documentary type of thing. My particular boss likes to talk about stories that are authentic, or organic. So what that means, they're not looking for a script to be fabricated for them to parrot, right? They want something that shows this is a real person. The concept, their their particular construct for the storytelling that our our group does like that from time to time. Potential hire, you're you're going to get that. You're going to get that from a um, company. Here's the truth of it, Ryan. That particular employer may or may not know what storytelling is, but they know that everybody is doing it and that everybody wants that. And so there it is on the resume. There it is on cover letter. The step you need to take as a potential hire is to demonstrate what storytelling means, either through your portfolio or in the cover letter that, that you compose, because that'll be very helpful. And, and I don't necessarily mean, I know I do not mean this at a knock at any potential employer, not really having a grasp at storytelling, but knowing that they need it within their, their media. I'll put it back on myself. When I talked to you earlier about digital marketing, I thought I knew what it was about, but I was smart enough to realize I really didn't know the depth of it, of what it's about. And now that I'm hiring somebody that has that skill set, it's teaching me what it really is and how effective it's going to be for 
us developing videos in the future. I learned a few years ago, and it took a while to, to make this transformation, but there's a big difference in doing an interview and having a conversation with someone. I, I feel like when you frame it as, oh yeah, you know, I, I want to interview you. We're going to do a profile on you, Ryan. We're going to do a profile on you. Uh, I've got about four or five questions I'd like to ask you. There might be some follow-up questions. Uh, I can send you a list of the questions if that's easier for you ahead of time. And then you receive the questions and uh, the, I think the person ultimately feels like they have to perform. They gotta, I gotta get these answers right, right? I don't, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna look like a fool or sound like a fool, so let me get these answers going. And really what you want is a conversation. And a big part of that conversation is having the pre-conversation, which I typically call the pre-interview. That's when you know to get the personality of who you're gonna be talking to. That's when you practice your listening. That's where you find areas to offer praise because you want to build up the confidence of the person you're talking to. You want them to feel that they're in a safe space. Um, so when you actually are on location and you're having the conversation, you're working off of four or five concepts, or let's call them topics, four or five topics. And um, you just roll, you know, and you, 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 you engage with the person, you have the conversation. Um, this is typically how it goes for me now. I, I Before we roll, um, I say, hey, you know, Ryan, we talked a little bit before about <clears throat> the importance of uh, what it would mean to the students uh, in, in terms of they had a space like a podcast studio before. And, you know, you kind of said a couple of things that I think are really important. Uh, what do you, you know, are you still, do you still feel that way, you know, now? And you're like, yeah, I, I really think that having accessibility and, and making this podcast skill you know, the, as part of an essential skill in the skill set of what we're teaching in, in media is, you know, ultimately important. It'll benefit so many students in so many different areas. All right. So Ryan, talk, tell me about how podcast studio, what the effect and benefit is going to be for the students. And then you go, right. But it's all part of the conversation. It doesn't mean I might, you know, turn a particular aspect around and say, yeah, just talk specifically about the benefits to the student. And if you, and, and prior to that, it might've taken five minutes to get to that, that key point. So the pre-interview conversation for me and for my colleagues, we come away with a story from that. And now when we go into the conversation for the actual video, now we're looking for those, you know, we're laying those gems, the nuances, the anecdotes, the things of that nature that make the person that much more flesh and blood to the audience occur, knowing that we're going to have the key elements that we need for the story uh, to be told. And it's, it's, it's easy to do an interview following four or five questions, but I've seen people like overthink interviews a lot and they're trying to make sure they get everything and they've got 10 or 12 questions and I think it scares the person about to be interviewed. I, I really do. I, I think a smart move is to list it as topics knowing that there'll be, you know, some follow-up or some conversation about maybe a certain aspect of it. You might tell a story about a particular student of yours and I might stop and go, hey, tell me a little bit more about, you know, about Jane's experience in your class. That that was really, that was really a good story. You know, I got a little bit of a tear on that one, just, but I, I want to know more. I think the audience will like it. And, um, you know, and it, it it's it's little things like that. I, I think um, you have to have the energy for it too, Ryan. That's a big part of it. If you have this type of, you know, conversation, um, it, it, it can drain you. You know, if you are into it and engaging with the person, you use a lot of mental energy, a lot of emotional energy, and it, it you know, it, it will. There's been times I get home in the afternoon and I can't talk. You know, I tell my wife I've been talking all day and I can't talk. You know, just clear up whatever falls out of my mouth at that point. The emotional energy. Do you have any tricks for managing emotional energy whenever you're dealing with clients that are that are maybe more demanding? Yeah. Uh, I think it's very important to match energy. You've got to display the energy that you want from your talent. 
I, I don't mean, you know, you got to get a jump up and down, but the biggest thing I, especially with faculty, this is huge, is getting them to smile. Now, just got to smile. If you remember when we were working with you and Willie doing the AIC piece, you guys had good energy. You had matched energy, but Willie had to bring his energy level up, his height and his energy level up to match yours. And that's important. If you want the person to smile, if you want them to, you know, be comfortable when I'm directing, I have to share, I have to portray that. When I'm directing, I'm not looking down at them, telling them to act a certain way or, you know, a certain line. I'm like getting them comfortable and being their best friend and a cheerleader for them. The smile is important. It's incredibly important. Um, and you have to do things to distract your, your talent or the person that you're interviewing or having a conversation with. So many times, you know, you know, the most, probably most anxiety, the most nervous you're going to be is when you're looking at the camera lens and the person tells you go, and then you have to start. That's, that's to some people that's like bungee jumping, like being right at the edge and having just to jump. So what I like to do with folks is, is distract them. And, um, you know, I get them to look off camera. I said, look at me and, you know, big smile. I'll do something silly. And then I said, okay, now over to the camera. And then they're comfortable because they're not like focused on just that lens is about to, you know, be on top of me. So I, I, that's a lot of it. You know, it's just kind of having a, um, caring about who you're talking to. And your clients are professional, smart people. And often professional, smart people have a lot of trouble communicating and making themselves clear in a very short amount of time. When you're used to lecturing for an hour and a half, it can be a real challenge to shrink down an idea and communicate it clearly. I imagine that you have some tips for working with such smart clients. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I do. Now, this is something I just kind of thought of, I guess, but I'm, I'm not, I'm sure it's probably other people have used this idea, but you're exactly right. Um, our faculty are used to writing academic papers and, um, I've got an example of this happening right now with a particular faculty that we're going to highlight for, um, a certain grant project. And, um, what I typically do is I come back and say, what I really need from you is an abstract of this. Think about what you turn in to speak at a conference. So I'll need that abstract and description, and it needs to be 450 words or less. So that helps a lot, you know, because you, your abstract is typically what? 6,500 words, something like that. Then along with the description in there, it is, um, very helpful. I feel framework for our clients many times to put a word count to it. And we equate about 150 words, uh, is about a minute in uh, real time. So I'm looking for scripts, papers that are 300, 450 words like max. And the, the one I'm working with right now is 688 words. So we got some work there to do. Plus it's not structured the way I need it. It's structured like, um, something that's going to be turned into the Dean or something like that. So that, that is, that is part of it. The other part is I've got a colleague that I can send that to and say, can you make this more friendly? Um, yeah, they're a great writer. So they, they are able to extract the key concepts out of there and put them in a, in a form that makes a better story. I love that. Perfect. And where can we find you online, Ernest? Uh, the best place to find me to, to, you know, for us to have a, a conversation or a chat, uh, LinkedIn. Ernest, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. We appreciate you. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate that you uh, gave me the opportunity to do this. I'm really excited about this podcast series that you're producing. And anytime, uh, you know, you need a hand, just let me know. Awesome. Thank you.